Do you ever hear a recording of your voice and think, Eesh, is that what I sound like to other people? Even if we like our voice, how can we be sure that other people are hearing it the way we think they're hearing it? It doesn't matter if you're a professional speaker like me or a sane person with a regular job. People make important snap decisions about you each and every day just based on the sound of your voice. The good news is a great voice can be learned. Actually, it's easier than you'd think. Unfortunately, it isn't taught in school. We're taught to read and write, of course, but not how to speak and listen. So I sat down with the guy who is single-handedly picking up that slack. His five TED Talks have reached over 90 million people, with the latest being the sixth most viewed all time. He is the author of How to Be Heard, Secrets for Powerful Speaking and Listening, and the creator of a brand new online course called How to Speak So That People Want to Listen. We had a great conversation and he unloaded the goods on how you can maximize your vocal toolbox. He explained the single biggest shift that you can make to speak more influential, even though it's not what you'd expect. And he even compared uh, his UK accent to my Boston accent. Here's the full interview and stick around because at the end he gave all of my listeners five free videos and half off his new course. Okay, here is my conversation with the great Julian Treasure. How much are we judged by the sound of our voices? Well, the voice is the, possibly the most powerful sound in the world. It's the only sound that can start a war and say, I love you. It's an instrument that we all play. And it's an incredible instrument when you think of the breadth of uh, what the human voice can do from Pavarotti to, you know, Mongolian overtone chanting, <clears throat> excuse me, to clearing your throat. Uh, I think it has a huge effect in the way that we're received. It's the most natural way to communicate. We've been using complex language for anything up to 200,000 years, they estimate. Writing only came along 4,000 years ago. So for all that time, this has been the primary way uh, in which human beings have communicated. And when you think of people who've had powerful effects in the world, their voice has been a big, big part of that for good or for ill. And in, in the work I've been doing in the last, oh, I don't know, decade, uh, the most common thing that frustrates people is like, nobody's listening to me. I can't get my point across. People won't listen. And a lot of that is down to how well we are uh, skilled in using this incredible instrument. You mentioned in one of your TED Talks that the politicians who get elected tend to have deeper voices. And, you know, I'm curious, it, it seems to be a major decision who we're going to vote for. Uh, and I'm always fascinated with those moments that, that create influence, you know, at the end of the day, that, that, that create this influence. And, uh, you know, as a speaker myself, it's also important to understand, you know, what is happening in the minds of the audience when they hear certain types of voices and how quickly does that translate into a positive vibe or a negative vibe and uh, and and does it really really affect who we vote for well it is Keteris paribus everything else being equal so we tend to vote for politicians with deeper voices i wouldn't say it's the primary reason they get elected but margaret thatcher for example the former prime minister of the uk worked with voice coaches to lower her voice by a tone or two because she perceived that she wasn't being taken seriously and she ended up speaking you know much more down there um there are many many aspects of the voice i mean it's what i call the vocal toolbox it's a big thing i cover in the new course the, the whole vocal toolbox on the ted stage i had uh, like 12 minutes or something to cover this whole topic so it you know you can only touch on it in that time uh, in the course i got seven and a half hours so we cover it in some detail things like timbre you know the way your voice feels and we tend to describe voices that we like in the same way we describe a hot chocolate, rich, dark, warm, smooth, sweet, all those words apply. It's very difficult to have people listen to you. You know, you've got a very creaky voice like this and you speak, it's, it's kind of hard work for people to listen. Now, the good news for anybody who's got timbre that's challenging is you can work on these things with a voice coach and with exercises so they can all be improved. Pitch is another one. You know, if you tend to speak up here, uh, people tend to think you're a little bit 
less impressive than somebody who speaks down here. And you can, again, you can practice these things. You can move, <clears throat> excuse me, you can move your voice uh, by practicing with resonance. You can put your hand on your chest and really focus on resonating your hand. And that will tend to move your voice down, the resonance of your voice down and give you more depth and more power. And we certainly uh, need that a lot of the time in life. I'm sad to see so many people suffering from something that's called vocal fry. I don't know if you've come across that one, Tim, but you, you probably have a lot in the States. You may not know the name, vocal fry. Sounds, sounds like this. It's a very croaky way of speaking. And it's become uh, almost fashionable to speak in this way. Now, not only is it not very good for your voice, but it really robs you of the power of this incredible instrument in order to use the kind of prosody I'm using, the sing-song of speech, to pitch at the right level, to be resonant, to project in a, in a big space. You know, try, try talking in a large theatre like this. It really doesn't work very well. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are not even touching the potential of this incredible instrument. And it's having an effect on the outcomes of their life. That's the key thing. I know that when I walk out onto a stage, people are, are definitely uh, sizing me up. And for good or for ill, they factor in the, the sound of my voice long before they factor in the words that I'm saying. And they make a decision. Is this someone I'm going to <clears throat> let in? Is this someone I'm going to listen to? Or is this someone uh, I'm not going to listen to? So that... That really fascinates me. One area that I wanted to ask you about, I'm from New England, Boston specifically, and my natural accent isn't uh, the most flattering. So um, speak, speak to that a little bit. I know you cover accents in your course. Um, the, the real question that I'm getting at is when you're training your voice, when you're training for resonance and timbre and prosody, are you losing any of your natural personality? No, uh, I think this is a question of enhancing yourself and being realistic. There's a key transformational understanding in the course, which is that we always speak into a listening. Mm -hmm. Now, most people have the assumption that everybody listens like I do. Just you listen, isn't it? No, every individual's listening is unique. And that means when you're in front of one person, a thousand people, you're speaking every time into a unique listening. It changes over time. You know, the person may just have had an argument with their partner or uh, some bad news, or they must have just, they may, may just have had some tremendous news. Their listening for you will be affected by what's just happened to them and also by all the factors, the road they've traveled to this moment in this conversation. Uh, you know, their, their parents, their teachers, their role models, friends, values, attitudes, beliefs, expectations, intentions, and so forth. All of these things fashion a listening. And if we're sensitive to that listening, then it's our job to get the ball over the net and to speak in the best way we can in order to be understood by this group of people. Now, I have no doubt, Tim, that if you were standing on a stage in downtown Boston somewhere, the old, you know, have a dad might come back a bit and you would probably start speaking in the vernacular because they all listen in that way. On the other hand, come to the UK and you'd probably want to moderate it a little bit. And just in the same way, we have to be conscious of the vocabulary we're using and how appropriate it is, how appropriate our delivery and our content are for the people we're talking to. I think that that just brought up an, another question in my mind. You know, you hear a lot about, you know, again, when it comes to influencing others, be it in sales, leadership, whatever, that it's important to match or mirror the other person. So if the other person is using horrible vocal technique, uh, producing horrible sounds, do we want to step into that to mirror and match in a one-on-one -on -one situation or a one-on-one -on -one setting? Yeah, I would say probably not. I mean, if you're talking to somebody who's got an affliction of some kind or somebody who's struggling or, you know, really has a problem with their voice, I don't think it's necessary to, I mean, it's almost patronizing or insulting agree, uh, right. to go there. Uh, 
Um, no, I think what you do is you sensitively ask, how can I both get, best get across to this person? And again, it's the question, what's the listening? And it may be if the person's a very slow person, you want to slow down. Mm. On the other hand, it might be a highly energetic person, in which case you want to get a bit faster and be with them because you can have a clash. You know, if you're, if you're not sensitive to this, the person will get bored fast or they'll get lost and, and bemused easily these things can happen just think of talking to you know a very old person who perhaps needs more time and simpler explanations now i'm not being patronizing to i'm talking very old here uh, somebody who's you know not able to listen that well uh, as my mother was towards the end of her life and i had to change the way i spoke to her on the other hand think of the way we speak to babies you know, that's a listening we are very, very conscious of and, and one in which we're, we're very good at speaking to you. We start to inflect, oh, no, mm -hmm. you know, you don't speak like that to your friends. Oh, no, <laughs> that's a baby talk. So speaking into the listening is, I mean, it's one of the key things in the course and something I go on about all the time because you have this circle, you see, speaking and listening are intimately related. And actually, there's a chunk of the course about listening skills and I do explain in the course that in order to be a great speaker, it is really important also to be a good listener. Very difficult to speak effectively to somebody if you don't understand them and if you're not listening to them. So what would be a, a bigger compliment to you if someone were to say to you, Julian, I could speak with you all day or Julian, I could listen to you all day. Which one feels like a hundred percent? Now, what, why is that? because it's not all about just sending um you know one of the things i, I talk about in on stage when i do keynotes is that we have four communication mechanisms right there's reading writing speaking listening we teach two of those at school mm -hmm. reading and writing it's a scandal if a child leaves school unable to read or write millions of children leave school every year never having been taught to use this incredible instrument we all possess and even less so having been taught how to use these things. You know, there's the old adage, we have two ears and one mouth. And yet, I'm gonna give you an example. My TED talk on speaking, that has been seen by something like five times as many people as my TED talk on listening, hmm. QED. We are much more concerned about sending than we are about receiving. And social media and personal broadcasting, you know, tweeting away the whole time, send, send, send. Ask a company what they, think of when you say the word communication and it's all outbound mm -hmm. they, they are very very insensitive to inbound and unfortunately that's something that is a real problem in the world you know I, I often joke politicians go off and have talks I wish they would go off and have listens instead I think we'd be in a much happier world if that was the case but sadly that's not the case so it's a much bigger compliment to me I think if somebody says I could speak with you all day and that's a that's a two-way process not I could listen to you all day because they're being passive there. Hmm. And, I, and I think you may even, be, you know, you might be in the minority there. Uh, I actually heard something on the way here uh, to, back to my office in the car that, um, you know, I think would, would resonate with you and resonate with our audience. And it had to do with the sales conversation. And it was something to the effect of you don't want prospects to listen to you. They're, they're not a prospect if they're just listening to you. They don't become yeah. a prospect until they start speaking with you. Is it possible to, 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 get, like, to get people to talk to you? Yes, it is, by listening. And it's, uh, you know, there are exercises in the course about how to listen to people. In particular, the one I, I mentioned on the TED stage as well, Rasa, which is very powerful in conversation. If we listen, if we make a space, people love talking about themselves, most people do. And I've always, always understood that the most important part of a sales conversation is the listening, not the speaking. You know, we've all had the experience of a high pressure salesperson. You, you can't get a word in edgeways and they're selling us 95 things we don't want when there is one thing we do want, but they never discover it because they don't ask, you know, asking open questions, listening to the responses, being with the person actually taking them on a journey that they can understand in in the conversation that that goes somewhere they want to go that that addresses their particular issues 
that's the skill of a great salesperson. And, and you don't feel like you're being sold to if you're with somebody like that. They're just helping you to solve a problem. Mm. Uh, if you don't know what somebody's problem is, you can't solve it for them. And that you have to get by listening to them and asking them questions. Contrast for, for us, for our listeners, content versus delivery. That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Which um, I was actually able to ask Chris Anderson, uh, who is the head of TED, uh, who's been running TED since 2003. Um, and I've been there so many times. I know Chris quite well now. And I was able to interview him for my book. Uh, and I, I got a chunk of that interview into the course. Um, and I agree with him on this. The winner, if you have to have a winner, they're both important, but if you have to have a winner, the winner has got to be content. You can survive somebody who's speaking about something incredibly important and, and you know, world shifting. If they're dull, you can survive that. On the other hand, a brilliant presenter who's talking vapid nonsense is just irritating hmm. because they could be doing so much more. So, Content has to come first, and there's a whole chapter in, in the course about how to design great content, how to hit the bullseye every single time. I have seen so many corporate presentations, people on stage miss the mark. I mean, death by PowerPoint, bullet points, you know, the, the whole panoply of killing people's interest uh, with inappropriate content that's poorly fashioned and poorly delivered. It's good to get both things. And the whole idea of the course really is get the great content and then deliver it brilliantly. And that's the way you win. And I was very uh, pleasantly surprised to see at how helpful your course was on actually developing content. And, you know, I'm going to ask a silly question here, but it's going to lead to another question. In all cases, are fewer words better than more words? Uh, I would say pretty much always yes. I'm a great fan of simple, plain language. And, uh, you know, I talk in the course and in the TED Talk, I introduced this concept, the foundations of powerful speaking, honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love, which spell hail. Well, I think honesty is about being clear and straight. And it's very hard to do that if you're using lots and lots of flowery language and jargon in particular, um, you know, words like provide and going forward and so forth. I tend to avoid those kind of bits of vernacular and use the simplest word in every instance and the fewest words, to be honest, uh, because I think people's attention spans these days are pretty short. We are not going to sit and listen to the Gettysburg Address comfortably these days, unfortunately, we want the soundbite. So it behooves anybody who wants to be well received these days to be relatively brief. Your most viewed TED Talk doesn't uh, allot the full 18 minutes. I think it's closer to 10 minutes, um, you know, which is, a, which is a testament to that. I also heard a, an architect who said, great design is not achieved when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, there are musicians who've said very, very similar things in the past, too. Hmm. So, you know, and it's so funny because there is, uh, in some cases, pressure in, in the marketing space, in the social media space to keep putting out content, put out more and more and more content. Uh, but I do love this idea of even if you're putting out lots of individual pieces of content, that those pieces are succinct and clear and concise and uh, and i think it's an important area for all uh, not just speakers but you know salespeople, leaders uh really really anybody who's who's involved in any kind of influence well thank you tim I, and that's the intention you know i've been doing this work for a while and uh i i i've had the pleasure of traveling the world a great deal over the last few years uh, but i had a pulmonary embolism last year which is a serious mm. thing and is a result of flying DVT and so forth. So anybody who's listening to this, if you fly a lot, do look after yourself, you know, lots of water, stretch, uh, take care of yourself. Um, well, that's caused me to have a rethink. I've got a four-year-old daughter and I'd love her to be living into a world where there's a great deal more understanding than we're seeing right now. And you only have to look at the politics that's going on. It's a politics of shouting, you know, diplomacy in 140 characters, all that kind of stuff where it's, it's very adversarial, polarizing. Uh, 
And I think that's a slippery slope, which is coming about because we're not listening enough. And equally, we're not very good at speaking into other people's listening. So the whole thing is to spread understanding in the world to help people to achieve better outcomes in their lives. And every one person who does a course like this and gets better at speaking and listening and communicating, there's a ripple effect that goes out into all the people around them. And that is significant. So I get pretty excited by the fact that I think it's 98 million people have seen my TED Talks now. Well, that's a chunk of the world's population and there's ripples going out if they're doing something about it. Unfortunately, I guess the vast majority of those people go, oh, that was nice, on to the next one. <laughs> that's mm. how we consume TED a great deal of the time, you know. Um, the ideas have to be put into action and that's why I've done this course. I want to fly a bit less. I want to get this out to as many people as possible because I seriously think this is so necessary uh, in a world which is dominated now by shouting and conflict. You know, uh, speaking of popular TED Talks, Amy Cuddy, who sits now at number two, uh, talks mm. about power posing. When you put your body yeah. in a position of confidence, you feel more mm. confident. Do you believe mm -hmm. there is a similar power voice where if you speak with a resonant tone or speak with, with proper technique, that it affects how you feel inside? Mm. I do, yes, I think so. Um, there's actually a chapter of the course called Fit to Speak, which is delivered by my, my partner, Jane Majendi, who's a four-time world champion martial artist. And that's got some exercises which limber up the whole voice and, and create the kind of positive hormones that Amy Cuddy's talking about with the, the power poses, testosterone mm. flows. Uh, nevertheless, that's only part of the issue. I think most people would love to feel their voices there to support them. And that's why I've got a set of vocal warm up exercises, which do exactly the same thing. And you do those. I mean, I don't know if you do them, but I do them before I go on stage every single time. And I know when I'm going on stage, my voice is right there, ready to support me. And it fills me with confidence. So, yes, I do think if your voice is ready, warmed up and powerful, you feel that much better. And you stand a little better. taller, walk a little prouder, if you will. And, and, and I truly believe audiences uh, pick up on that. Once again, that yeah. tiny window of that first impression. We all say first impressions are important. There are so many yeah. factors that go in. People can learn so much about you from your voice. Uh, this was incredibly valuable, Julian. Thank you so much for your time. Here is the special link where you can get those five free videos from Julian's course, as well as half off the enrollment. My website which is juliantreasure.com forward slash Tim. And of course, you'll find that link somewhere on this page, I'm sure. Uh, what an honor it was to speak with such a legend in the speaking world. I hope you found it as valuable as I did. The old, you know, have a yad.